Hi, and welcome to this free Blazor crash course. In this course, we will be going to build an actual Blazor WebAssembly application based on .NET 5, step by step, so that you can follow along and code along yourself. We'll be going through the fundamentals of Blazor, so that after this crash course, you can implement a fully functional web app yourself. I highly recommend that you build the application yourself instead of only watching the videos to make the most out of this crash course. Hi, I'm a software engineer with more than 10 years of experience with the .NET platform. In this crash course, we focus on Blazor web app development. Are you new to Blazor and want to build your first Blazor application? Maybe you already know a few things about Blazor, but wish to learn more and take your knowledge to the next level? If you are completely new to Blazor and want to find out how it works and if it's something you should consider learning, check out my introduction to Blazor video. You'll learn about what Blazor is and how powerful its component model is. If you heard about Blazor before and are interested in creating an actual app using Blazor, this free Blazor course is perfect for you. However, you should be familiar with c -sharp in general. In this crash course, we'll be building a Blazor WebAssembly web application. It means that the application will be running natively in the browser. Blazor Server is another hosting model that we are not going to cover in this crash course. If you don't know the differences between Blazor Server and Blazor WebAssembly, check out the videos linked in the card. Now let's take a look at the application we're going to build. Welcome to Finance Mentor. Finance Mentor is a simple income and expense tracker for personal use. At the top of the dashboard, we see a chart of our earnings and expenses in the current year. Below, we see monthly charts with more details about the category of each expense or earning. We have a menu on the left where we can navigate to the earnings page. On the earnings page, we see a detailed list of all the earnings. On the right side, we have a form that we can use to add additional data. When I hit the submit button, we also see that we have basic validation on the form input. Let's fix my mistake and add an entry. After submitting, we see a new row in the list on the left. Let's head back to the dashboard and check if the new entry has changed anything. As we can see, the current month's chart now contains a freelancing category with the amount we filled in before. Let's check out the last entry in the main menu, where we have almost the same features on the expenses side as we explored before with the earnings. We can also remove existing entries using the delete button. A click on the delete button opens a model dialog asking for confirmation. Most user interface elements are part of the widely used Bootstrap user interface framework. Bootstrap is part of the default Blazor project template. We use another UI library for the charts and the model dialog that we will learn about in future videos of this series. That's the current state of the application we're going to build step by step in this Blazor crash course. If you have any feature requests or other questions, write them in the comments. I read the comments and implement additional features based on your feedback during the video series. If you haven't already, this would be the perfect time to hit the subscribe button so you don't miss future videos. Now let's finally open Visual Studio and start our project by creating a new project based on the default Blazor WebAssembly template. Before you start, make sure to update Visual Studio 2019 to the latest version and install the .NET 5 SDK. Within Visual Studio 2019, we get started by clicking on the Create a new project button. In the Project Creation Wizard, we select the Blazor app template and click Next. Now we need to choose a name for the project and set the location on the disk. We go with Finance Mentor for the project name and I create it in my default Git path. Don't change the solution name and click on Create. Within the Create a new Blazor app dialog, we select Blazor WebAssembly app and make sure that .NET 5 is selected as the target framework. We don't change anything in the Authentication section. In the Advanced section, we check ASP.NET Core hosted. 
This option will generate a backend application for the Blazor WebAssembly client application. We click on Create and wait for the project to be created and opened by Visual Studio. By the way, this is a great time to hit the like button if you haven't already. Although it's tempting to start working on the code right away, let's first build and start the application to see how the web application currently looks. As we can see, we have a classic two-column layout with a menu on the left and the content on the right. We have the name of the application in the menu's header and we have three sections within the menu. The homepage has static content. Let's click on the counter menu item. Here we have a more dynamic example. If we click on the click me button, the counter increases. When we click on the fetch data menu item, we get the data table with forecasted weather information. This page might not look any different from the static homepage, but it is. The data displayed on this page gets generated in the backend and accessed through an API call. Don't worry, we'll talk about that later in this course. Back in Visual Studio, it's time to look at the artifacts generated by the Blazor WebAssembly app project template. In the Solution Explorer, we see three projects. The client project contains the Blazor WebAssembly application. The server project contains an ASP.NET Core Web API project. And the shared project is a class library that contains code that is shared between the two applications. If you did not check ASP.NET Core hosted while creating the solution, you would only see a single client project. In this video, we're going to explore the Blazor WebAssembly client project. The focus of this crash course is to learn about Blazor, and we'll talk about the backend as soon as it's needed to implement the features for the Finance Mentor application. Let's start with the program.cs file. Like any other .NET Core based application, there has to be a public static main method. The setup for a Blazor WebAssembly app is simple. We use the WebAssembly host builder factory to create a builder. Next, we add the root component called app to the builder. To start the application, we call builder.build.runAsync. I skipped line 20, where we add a scoped service to the dependency injection container. In this case, we register an instance of the HTTP client initialized with the current backend URI. We don't need to worry about it right now. Next, let's look at the app.razor file. The app.razor file contains the root component of the application, which is referenced in the program.cs file. It contains a router definition. Right now, we don't need to know much more than that the default layout is the main layout component. Let's take a look at the main layout.razor file. The main layout component defines the two column layout we saw when we started the application. We have the nav menu component containing the menu and the div with the main CSS class applied that contains the page's content. Let's take a look at the nav menu razor file. The nav menu component contains the title of the application shown in the top left corner of the application and the menu with the three menu items home, counter and fetch data. Let's take a look at the index.razor file. The index component uses the add page directive on line one. Using the add page directive makes the component a page. It tells the router that if the user accesses the provided URI, this page must be loaded. In this case, the route is defined by a slash making the index component the default page for the application. Below the standard HTML content of the index page, we have a reference to the survey prompt component. Isn't it great how simple we are able to use a different Blazor component? Interestingly, we can provide an argument to the survey prompt component by using standard HTML syntax using a custom title property. Let's take a look at the survey prompt.razor file. The survey prompt component we referenced in the index page also contains standard HTML. In the Blazor specific add code section, we have C sharp code that can be used within the HTML template. Blazor makes use of a component programming model comparable to React. There is a public string title property 
which is used on line 3 in the HTML template. The parameter attribute on line 14 makes the property available when we reference it in another component. Let's take a look at the counter.razor file. The counter component is also defined as a page using the add page directive. It can be accessed using the slash counter path. Now let's take a closer look at the implementation of the component. We have a private int current count variable initialized with zero that is used on line five in the HTML template. We also have a increment counter method on line 12 that is used on line seven. As you can see, it's very simple to attach a C# -sharp method to an HTML button by using the addOnClick attribute and providing the name of the method as an argument. Whenever we want to do something blazor specific, we use the add symbol followed by a directive or an attribute name. You see how few code lines we need and how tidy the definition of this component is? It's one of the strengths of blazor. It allows us to code components efficiently. Let's take a look at the fetchdata.razor file. The fetchdata component also uses the add page directive, which makes this component a page. On line 2, we see a using statement for the first time. It allows us to import classes from different namespaces to use within this component. On line 3, we use the add inject directive that tells Blazor that we request an instance of the HTTP client type from the dependency injection container. We can access it using the HTTP identifier defined after the requested type. The template uses a few more Blazor features. First, we have an if else on line 9 and a for each on line 25. Both constructs exactly work as you know them from other C -sharp application types. Blazor offers a very clean syntax to use C -sharp code within the template section to define our component's appearance. In the code section starting on line 38, we have a private field that contains the weather data. On line 41, we use a lifecycle method called initialized async to load the data from our backend API using the HTTP client injected in the fetch data component. As you can see, this component is doing a little more than the counter component before, but it still uses simple syntax and only a few code lines. We'll discuss API handling in a future video of this crash course in more detail. Last but not least, let's take a look at the www root folder. The www root folder contains the static artifacts like the index.html file, the CSS files we use, and if your application uses JavaScript files, they would also be within this folder. We don't go deeper into those files right now because those files don't contain anything Blazor specific. This video is the first part of the Blazor crash course. Congratulations! You learned about how to create your first Blazor WebAssembly application hosted by a .NET Core Web API backend. We also looked at the artifacts generated by the Blazor WebAssembly project template and how the application looks in the browser. We also learned the fundamentals of the Blazor component model. In the following video of this series, we'll be starting to change the code and implement new components. Tell me in the comments what you'd like to learn in a future video of this series. I'll do my best to include it as we go through building this application together. Thanks for watching, don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss the next part of the series and see you in the next video.